I love apples, and I love cocktails. So by the transitive property, I should love an apple cocktail, which is why today I'm making an apple toddy from 1869. We'll also talk about that legend of American apples, Johnny Appleseed, this time on Drinking History. Today's recipe comes from the 1869 book, Haney's Steward and Barkeeper's Manual, Apple Toddy. Two wine glasses of apple jack, one tablespoon of white sugar, half of a baked apple. Add boiling water and nutmeg. This drink ought never to be made with a suspicion of weakness. It is only drank in cold weather and needs to be a little strong to be satisfactory to the Epicurean. And as an Epicurean, I will make sure that there is no suspicion of weakness to my apple toddy. But first, I have a question. What is that main ingredient, apple jack? Sometimes it's called apple whiskey, or more appropriately, apple brandy, and it should be made by distilling apple pumice. But most today now are not, because usually they're made with neutral spirits. But today we have Laird's Old Apple Brandy, and this is basically going to be the closest thing that we're going to get to what he is calling for in this recipe from the 19th century. So if you want to try a bottle of this, it is available at Curiata. They have all sorts of interesting liquors. Um, the website, I'll put a link down in the description, and they deliver to most of the US. But you gotta be careful with this Applejack because in 1894, the New York Times warned, there are few compounds that are more sinful than the Applejack of New Jersey. The name has a homely, innocent appearance, but in reality, Applejack is a particularly powerful and evil spirit. The man who intoxicates himself on bad whiskey is sometimes moved to kill his wife and set his house on fire, but the victim of Applejack is capable of blowing up a whole town with dynamite and of reciting original poetry to every surviving inhabitant. It's the poetry that'll get you every time. All the same, I'm going to use the amount that he calls for, which is two wine glasses, or now four ounces, wine glasses were much smaller back then, uh, four ounces of Applejack, which is actually still quite a lot. And before we mix anything else in, I think it's only wise to try this Laird's Old Apple Brandy by itself. Mm. That's good. It is very whiskey. It's not very apple-y. Um, I mean, because I took a drink, so I had to add more. Uh, I mean, whiskey doesn't taste of corn or whatever they end up using. It's nice. It's got a little burn, but it doesn't have those the, the notes of a lot of whiskey. So if you're looking for something like a very neutral kind of a starter whiskey, this is actually probably a very nice alternative. Then add a tablespoon of sugar. You could probably add a little bit less. His tablespoon was probably smaller. It's hard to tell. Um, kind of stir that in. It actually dissolved pretty well, but it'll dissolve even better when we add the boiling water. Then we put in some nutmeg. The amount of nutmeg that you use is really up to you. I use quite a bit because I like it. Some people might not want so much. And if John Townsend was here, he'd probably use the whole darn nutmeg. Now this is going to be served with some baked apple, and for that you can just core an apple, pop it in the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, 175 Celsius for about 40 minutes. Now he calls for a half apple. I'm probably going to be using a quarter apple because the apple he was using was probably quite a bit smaller. I don't know that a half apple is even going to fit in this glass. He was probably using something more akin to what Johnny Appleseed was planting. John Chapman was born in Leominster, Massachusetts in 1774, and in the 1790s studied to become an orchardist. And he did become quite the orchardist. See, at that time, land on the American frontier was pretty much up for grabs as long as you could take care of it. So people would go out and start a farm and that became their land. But if you become a farmer, it's a lot of work. You gotta be there year round to take care of the land. Well, old Johnny had an idea to scale the operation. So he went every fall to Pennsylvania and grabbed all of the seeds that had been left over after the cider making process. And then in the spring, he would go find a few plots of land and scatter those seeds and plant apple orchards. He would return every couple years just to make sure they were go going well. He put up fences, but really, an apple orchard doesn't need a lot of tending. A brilliant businessman for sure, though he didn't really look or act like a brilliant businessman. Most of us today picture Johnny Appleseed as Walt Disney showed him, a clean-faced lad with bare feet and a pot on his head. 
but according to early accounts, he had filthy wild hair and a matted, unkempt beard. And usually, while traveling through the forests, his only garment was a coffee sack with holes cut out for his head and arms. He went barefoot most of the time, even in winter. He was a strict vegetarian, eating no meat or fish. He believed it was wrong to take life in order to procure food. So Disney got the bare feet part right, and oddly enough, the pot on the head as well. He wore a pyramid of three hats. The first was only a brim. Next came his cooking pot. Surmounting all was a hat with a crown. The sum total was, if extremely odd, rather ingenious. It was ingenious because it kept his books dry, because that's where he kept his books in the pot on his head. And those books were the texts of the Church of Swedenborg, named after Emanuel Swedenborg of Sweden. Swedenborg was a scientist turned revelator after having a vision from God after a particularly large meal where God told him not to eat so much. That's true. This was the man who Victor Hugo described as having glided into insanity. And this was the man that Johnny Appleseed followed devoutly. It was why he was a vegetarian. It was why he wouldn't even defend himself against wild animals. He once befriended a, uh, a wolf cub and took him about on his travels. And why he said he would not marry in this world, but would have a pure wife in heaven. When visiting people, he would often tear out pieces from the Swedenborg books and leave them behind. Eccentric, but harmless. And John Henry Cook believed him to be intelligent and full of pleasant story and good advice. He was entertaining, too. Whenever he came to a new town, he would gather all of the children around and entertain them by sticking needles into his calloused feet. Calloused because he had been walking around the country barefoot. That is a town that needs a bowling alley. Though not everyone was charmed by him. One account claims that he was nothing but a bum. All he did was come and sponge on people. He could come and stay and eat and eat and eat until you finally shoved him out and sent him on his merry way. See, he was building all of these orchards around the country, but he wasn't building anywhere for him to live. And so he would kind of depend on the kindness of strangers to feed him and to put him up for the night. Though after feeding him, where he stayed was usually the barn to protect everyone from his, what they called, wee beasties, or lice. But after nearly 50 years of this itinerant lifestyle, he had amassed over 1,200 acres of land. And that's what he left to his daughter when he died at the age of 70 in 1845. But his legacy was much more than that, because since he planted seeds rather than the more traditional of growing apple trees, which was grafting, he left hundreds of different varieties of apple trees around Indiana and Ohio, most of which were probably rather inedible. They were small, sour, almost crab apples that were good for making cider and Applejack. Probably not the kind of apple that you would want to use to actually put into our drink today, and that baked apple should be about ready now. So take the apple out of the oven, let it cool for a couple minutes, and then cut it up. So I'll add the apple, and then I will pour in some boiling water, making a mess all over the place. I'll give it another little stir here, just to see if we can't get some of that dissolved, but no worries if not. And here's our apple toddy. Perfect for autumn. Just give it a taste. That's good. Oh, that is so good. I mean, it's a little sweet from the sugar, but honestly, it's it's not that sweet. It's it's really this this is the the winner. Uh, it really flavors it, you know. But then it also the the sugar, the water, the nutmeg, it all softens this. I don't really know the point of the apple other than, you know, you put an apple in an apple toddy because I don't know how much flavor it's really going to give until I get down there when then I'll have a, an apple jack soaked apple. So you know what? I get the point of the apple. So again, there is a link to this old apple brandy or old apple jack down in the description at Curiata and go make yourself an apple toddy, especially if it's nice and cool outside, which it's not yet here in Burbank, but it's gonna be there any day now. So yeah, cheers, and I'll see you next time on Drinking History.